I love being at Biola. Thanks so much to the worship team who was up here and leading us in worship. What beautiful songs that we've already been able to sing to open up our time tonight. I mean, just amazing to think about the riches we have in Christ and what he's done in us because of the gospel. And we want to celebrate that tonight in our time together. But I want you to know that I love these opportunities where I get to take a little bit of time and build into your life. Um, I think highly of Biola students. Every year, a new crop comes in. Every year, a new crop, I mean, a new, an old crop leaves. Um, but we get to invest in you while you're here. And there are Biola students around the world. I mean, I think about some of these countries I've been to. And I would say in almost every one of those places, I run into Biola people. And Biola is impacting the world. And I'm so grateful for that. And just the opportunity to have an impact in your life tonight is a privilege for me. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1. If you would open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And I want to look at this passage tonight. You see the word poema back there, taken out of Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and from this word, poema, you might even hear it in the word, we have a related English word, poem. And so when we think about this word, we are God's poem in a sense. I mean, he's done something for us. There's a beauty to who we are. So what does that tell us? I mean, this word points to this fact that what Paul had in mind when he was writing this is that we are a creative masterpiece of God. We are his masterful creation. The word is only used twice in the New Testament. So the focus, I think, of this particular theme this year has been Ephesians 2.10. What I want us to do tonight is go to the second use of poema in the Old, in the Old Testament. So I used to say in that, in the New Testament. We want to see the second use of it, which is in Romans chapter 1, in verse 20. And we see it in these words, for his invisible attributes, talking about God, Namely, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, in the workmanship. Your Bible probably has different translations. New American Standard Bible says things that have been made because that's the sense of the word. The word simply means that which is made or that which is done it's a workmanship. And so in Romans 1.20, the use of the word there is when you look at all God's creation, what is it? It's his workmanship. But then in Ephesians chapter 2, when you look at what has happened in people's lives because of the gospel, who are they? Well, they are his workmanship. John Bloom, he's a really good a scholar, Christian leader, puts it this way. All that we see, hear, touch, taste and smell in the universe is reading God's creative masterpiece, his epic poem. When God imagines, his images come into real existence. His poems are living and active and multidimensional. So you think about all of creation, the intricacies of it. In the front yard of our house, we have these flowers. They're called lantanas. You know what lantanas are? There's beautiful flowers. I love my lantanas. Um, people come to our house and they talk about these lantanas that we have. Everything that God has created is a masterpiece. It's just beautiful to think about it. So the word is used of God's creation in the first instance, Romans 1.20, and then God's recreation. That's the way I want us to think about it. God's creation was his workmanship. What did God say at the end of the six days of creation? God saw everything that he had made and it was good. It was very good. His workmanship. It was a beautiful creation that he had made. But then the second time that it's used in Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 10, it's going to be with God's recreation and what God has done for us in Christ, and this is what I really want us to get tonight. What God has done for us in Christ is truly amazing. The fact that we've been recreated is just amazing. Created beings are amazing. We must understand that we are recreated beings. We're born again, 
And when you're a recreated being, if created beings are amazing, recreated beings are, and here's a word I've coined, it's mine, amazinger. <laughs> so created beings are amazing. Recreated beings are amazinger. And that's who we are in Christ. So when God saved you and made you his very own, he had plans in mind. He didn't save you to be someone else, but rather to be you, a masterpiece. He didn't save you so that you would not go to hell, although that might have been something that caught our attention. He saved you for himself. He chose you to be his very own. He gave you gifts, gave you personality, desires. He crafted you, formed you with skill and purpose but for his purposes. Do you understand that? The fact that you've been recreated as his workmanship is all for him. So we were just singing for his glory, but we've got to learn to live that into our lives as well. We're no longer our own. We are his in every moment of every day, of every month, of every year throughout your life until Jesus returns for us. Yet we have a problem Okay, this is what I want us to grasp tonight. We have a problem. How did we get from the point of when you look at God's creation, it was his workmanship to the fact that God had to recreate so that we could once again be his workmanship. Do you follow my question here? If his creation was his masterpiece, what happened so that God then had to recreate so his creation could be, his recreation could be his masterpiece. Something happened to God's original workmanship. And that's what brings us to Romans chapter one with this second um, use of um, poema in the New Testament. So I wanna make a few points. Here's my first point. And you can simply call it this, workmanship gone bad. Workmanship gone bad. Because whatever that was in creation, as God created human beings, that has gone bad. And Romans 1 gives us a story of this. In Romans 1, verses 21 to 31, it shows us very clearly what it means that workmanship has gone bad. There's a beginning point. Look at verses 19 through 21. The beginning point here is, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So there's this knowledge of God. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So there's this sense of God being known so that they're without excuse. For even though they knew God, this is that, that existence that is now in the past, workmanship gone bad. This present workmanship is, as we look at the message of the Bible, something's gone bad. They knew God back then. God made himself clearly evident. It, the creation shows that. But now his workmanship's gone bad. They knew God back then. God's not hidden himself. He's clearly revealed himself for all to see. And even though the world will not yield themselves for the most part to God, there's an awareness. See all the religions of the world. There's an awareness of this higher power that's out there. In America alone, a 2012 Pew report noted that only 4%, up to 4% of our population actually would call themselves an atheist. Now, there's other categories. When you're not an atheist, it doesn't mean that you believe in God. There's a lot of other categories that could be there, but only 4% of the United States of America could actually put into a category of no God. God has revealed himself. He's made himself clear. So notice the beginning point in verses 19 through 21. Although... They knew God. That was back then. They knew God. But we see that what follows in verses 21 and 23 is that there's this turning away from God. So even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. So now we have a change. This is workmanship gone bad. They did not honor him as God or give thanks. They became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was dark and professing to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image. What in the world? Why the glory of God to an image? Why, how in the world could that happen? 
in the image of, in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And so the beginning point was knowing God, but now there's this turning away. And what do they do? They exchange truth for a lie. And that's the state of humanity. That's workmanship gone bad. The exchange that we see in verse 23 there's a clear assumption, although they knew God, but now they exchange it. We exchange things too. Think about Christmas time. You ever get a gift, wrong size? What do you do? Take it back to the store and you exchange it. I have this, I no longer want it. I want this and then I take that, I exchange it. Or I don't like this tie or I don't like this whatever it is. I want my money back. I give you this, I take this. That's what creation has done with God. Although they knew him, they now exchange him. No, no longer. Don't like that tie. I want this instead. They just exchange God. God, I do not want you. And so people begin to put their focus and their passions elsewhere. It's not all glory to God but now we begin to look around in the world. What is it that I can cling to and find life? Satisfaction? What can relieve me of my pain? What can give me joy for just a moment? We exchange God, not God, I'll take that. And that's idolatry. It's stated differently in verse 28. It says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, they just don't acknowledge him anymore. And, and I, so I have a little phrase that I use. They live as if God is not. Just going to live as if he is not. I am my own. I will find life wherever I want to find it. Apart from him, I've exchanged him for something else. Now, what are the consequences of workmanship gone bad? You see, this isn't just a choice that people can make and then just be independent and autonomous from God. There are consequences of this decision. And Romans talks about this too. And it uses this term, God turns them over. And we see it several times in this passage. Look in verse 24. Therefore, okay, because of the exchange, therefore, God gave them over. And then look down in verse 26. There we see it again. For this reason... God gave them over. Then look again at verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. You see, God is not passive in the downfall of humanity. He doesn't say, just whatever, have your way. No, God says, I'm gonna turn you over. I'm gonna release you. You wanna exchange me? I I'm gonna release you. And tell me how that works out for you. Tell me how it works out. As a parent, there could be parents here, maybe not, maybe future parents, but I'm telling you this right now. When you become a parent, you'll learn a lot about God. When you become a parent, you'll learn a lot about what it, what it means for God to love his children. And there's gonna come a day in your parenting life where you will have to look your child in the eye and you will say, I'm just gonna turn you over. I'm going to release you. Go down that foolish path. And you and your spouse will go to bed with tears in your eyes and you will beg God to save your child. You'll beg God to save them from that mess that they're in. And that's the heart of God too. When it says here that God turns them over, it's not, ha ha, you'll get what you deserve. No, there's this broken heartedness of God where he allows humanity to walk down this path and he's not going to bail them out. He's going to wait for the phone call in the middle of the night. He's going to watch them end up as the prodigal in the field, eating the food of swines and his heart is broken. And so when workmanship goes wrong or goes bad, God's heart is broken at that point. But what did God give them over to? I mean, look at this grocery list. In verse 24, therefore God gave them over 
in the lusts of their heart to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever, amen. Verse 26, for this reason, reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged their natural function and in the same way also men abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, I mean, the list could go on and on. It reminds me of back in the book of Genesis when it says in chapter six, six chapters into the Bible, and God looked down and he saw only evil continually. The consequences of workmanship gone bad is God gives creation over and allows them to walk down a path and he turns them over to all of these futile ways of living. In verse 32, it says, and although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval. Yay, Yay! go for it. Go down that path. We're all for you. We're behind you. And it's a path to death. Been doing a lot of study in the book of Proverbs and Proverbs 1 through 9. And Proverbs 1 through 9 is just begging people about two paths. If you go down this path, it's a foolish path and you will end up in death. But if you go down this path, it's a wise path. There's life there. In Romans 6.23, which we oftentimes use in a salvation context, that's what it's talking about too. There's two paths. The wages of sin, you go down that path. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and abundant life now. But God turns him over to these things. It's a path that leads to death. And you need to understand, it's a broken-hearted God. Why? Because that was his workmanship, his poem. That which he had made, and it's gone bad. And what's the end result of a workmanship gone bad. People turn from and people turn to. And we see four different descriptions in our passage here in in chapter one, verse 22. They turn from wisdom. That's the path to life. They exchange that, they give that up and they turn to foolishness. That's the path to death. In other words, they say, give me death. I don't want life. They turn from glory, the glory of God, the one who stands behind all of creation as its author, and they begin to worship created things. They bow down to creatures. They turn from, in verse chapter 1, verse 25, from truth to lies. And also in verse, chapter 1, verse 25, the worship of God to the worship of created things. In other words, what do they do? We've talked about the exchange. They're living as if God is not. They remove God. They downgrade God to a manageable God. They minimize God. They live like he is not. And then they cling to created things, idols, as the object of their worship. And as a result, people worship and live for and bow down to created things to try to find life, to try to find satisfaction. Isaiah 44, 17 puts it this way. They bow before a block of wood and they say, and the point is a created thing, deliver me for thou art my God. Deliver me. I'm in pain. Deliver me. I want satisfaction. Deliver me. I don't like the world I live in. Deliver me bowing down to a block of wood. 
And we can cry from our knees. We talked about worshiping him on our knees. And instead of falling down on our knees and worshiping God, we fall down on our knees and we worship created things. That is workmanship gone bad. And that's what the text is talking about. Well, what about your situation? What, what, what is it for you that you're bowing down to, that you're clinging to? Is it relationships? If I just had her or if I just had him, life would be good. Or if he or she would just have sex with me, I would know true love. If I just had more money, oh, life would work out for me. If I could just get that job or that promotion or that recognition, oh, life would be good and we cling to it. If I could just numb the pain with another drink or my drug of choice, I'd feel so much better. If only blank was no longer true for me or that blank would come to an end, life would be sweet. If I could just be a starter on the team or be a better athlete or be starring in the murals, people would think much of me. I got game. And we cling to that. If I could just lose five pounds, have a bigger bicep, have straight hair or curly hair or just hair, <laughs> people would look my way. If I could dress like that or at least have nicer clothes or show more flesh wearing less clothes, then people would notice me. People would look my way. I'll get their attention. If I could make better grades or get a position on associated students, become an RA, then people would see me. If I just had a different roommate, life would be better. If I was at another school, you guys are awake, or could live off campus, or if I could just live on campus, or if I had a different coach, if I had nicer hair, a clearer complexion, a different or nicer car, if I, if I, if I, if I, and we cling and we bow down and we say, deliver me, make me feel better about this world I live in. That's workmanship gone bad. Let me talk about two categories of people. For lost people, who people who are not believers, they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Romans 1 is really talking about them. Workmanship gone bad, that's who they are. This is their only disposition. They are hopelessly lost in this position. They cannot find their way out of it. They are naturally hostile toward God. They cannot please him. They may seemingly do good, but it's always got self-interest attached to it. They're the picture of workmanship gone bad. And there's an eternity in hell that awaits them because of their rebellion, because of their refusal God will turn them over, and the last act of turning them over is allowing them to live in eternal separation from their creator. But there's another category, and that's saved people. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's most of us in this room. Saved people. For you, Romans 1 is no longer your disposition. You are no longer workmanship gone bad because praise the Lord for Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead and he made you alive. You were workmanship gone bad and chapter 2, verse 10 of Ephesians tells us that you are now his recreated workmanship created for good works. You now have a heart in you that doesn't have to bow down to an idol. You can lift your hands upward, your life upward, and you can live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The workmanship that has gone bad has been given a new beginning. Old things, they're passed away. New living has come. There's just one problem, and that problem is this. Even though you have a new beginning and you are a recreated workmanship, every one of us in this room and in Calvary Chapel, every one of us has the capacity 
to live a life that looks exactly like workmanship gone bad. Every one of us, even in our salvation, can turn away from the Lord and we can find ourselves living as a workman gone bad. Ephesians 4, 17 and following says this. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and says, I plead with you, do not walk as the Gentiles walk. In the darkness of their mind, the callousness of their heart, darkness of thinking, don't walk in that way. He says later, in, I think it's verse 21, you didn't learn that in Christ. That's over. That's been done. You're now a new creature. And if we're not careful, any of us can slide back into living that life of workmanship gone bad. So here's my plea with you tonight. Let's engage the battle. I want to tell you this tonight, and I believe it with all of my heart. You don't have to walk down that path of sin. Perhaps some of you are struggling tonight. You're battling sin. Maybe some of you have just given up. You feel like something's never going to change in you. I want to appeal to you that you don't have to live as workmanship gone bad because you've been recreated. You are a new poema. You have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Sin can be put to death in you. The Holy Spirit is here tonight. He indwells you tonight, and he wants to free all of us to live for him. And some of us are weighted down. Some of us have shackles. And God is calling us to a new place. He's calling you to a new place. A place where you walk in the newness of the Spirit. Listen, we can. Sin does not have to say the last, have to, have to, have to say the last word in our lives. The Holy Spirit can move we can find ourselves living righteously. I want to close by reading a couple of passage scriptures. I'm just going to read until I run out of time. But if you want to follow along, I'm going to be in Romans chapter 6. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to listen to these words. And whenever you hear something that applies to you, something that you just want to grab onto, pray that back to the Lord. Because this is who you are. You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Sin does not have to have the last word in your life. It does not have to control you. So just bow and pray. When you hear something, latch on to it and pray it back to the Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And let me add there, we are his workmanship. For he who has died is free from sin. Why? We are his workmanship. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus why we are his workmanship therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God why because we are his workmanship for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin 
because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one for whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Why? Because we are his workmanship. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and the lawlessness resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. Why? Because we are as workmanship. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from the things which you are now ashamed for the outcome of those things is death. No longer live in them. Why? Because we are as workmanship. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.